counsel for the petitioners is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. I'm Joe Jaco representing the Department of Health, and I wish to reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. Sir. For this supplemental question, two constitutional provisions are in play. Article 3, Section 11, there shall be no special law granting a privilege to a private corporation. And Section 10, excuse me, Article 10, Section 29D, the Department of Health shall issue reasonable regulations to ensure the availability and safe use of medical marijuana, and to do so no later than nine months after the effective date. As the legislature enacted the regulatory scheme for the Department of Health through Florida Statutes 381.986, Section 8, it charts a course to satisfy both constitutional provisions. In doing so, the statute's subparagraphs time the entry of MMTC licenses to ensure medical marijuana is available quickly and safely. But let me emphasize, all MMTC licenses or all MMTCs receive the same license. There's only one kind of license regardless of when an MMTC receives it. There is one bucket of MMTC licenses. And all of these licenses must meet the same statutory requirements. This is a comprehensive regulatory scheme that brings a certain number of licenses online at different times based on the readiness of those MMTCs. The timing satisfies the Constitution's commands for this unique product. On the statute's face, this is not a guise of general law for a particular entity. This 8A is general law, and upon examination of the statute, this court can see that for two reasons. First, MMTC licensure is an open class. The text of the statute itself says so. And second, the statute addresses a clear state interest in a uniform and rational manner. I'd like to discuss in more detail the, tax, the statutory text supporting this. Council, but could, could, could you uh, help me with this? Now, it, a couple of the categories here that, that are used in the statute are, are kind of undeniably closed categories. I mean, they're historical categories based on circumstances that had existed at a certain date and time. So you would admit that for, with respect to, to, uh, to those uh, categories that they are closed. No, Your Honor. When we look at the statute's text, we can start by reading it in peri materia. And that includes subsection four. Could you go, all of could, could you, could you go back and answer that question? There are some, a couple of these categories that are closed. Isn't that correct? No, Your Honor. These categories are not closed for three reasons. One, this court should read the statute, read the section in peri materia. When you look at that, that includes subsection four, and through subsection four and the previous subparagraphs, there are now 11 licenses available. This is clearly an open class. Even upon closer scrutiny, as Chief Justice, you mentioned, isolating each subparagraph, whether it be one, or 2A or 3, each one of those subparagraphs refers to the requirements of this section, which is section 8. Even subparagraph 4 includes this very same language that licenses must meet the requirements of this section. Those cross references to section serve two textual purposes. First, they require that all MMTCs must meet the same requirements. This includes vertical integration. But second, this cross references to section show that when subparagraphs one, two, and three time licenses, they do so in recognition of subsection four bringing on a future supply of licenses. Counsel, are, were you saying of the 11, is, were there 11 additional licenses under subsection four, or is there one more uh, in addition to the 10 that was mentioned earlier in the subsection? 
Your Honor, we've actually been 16 additional licenses that have come online through subsection four. Currently, there are 22 MMTCs, and currently there are 11 remaining licenses under the statutory structure. So of the total licenses issued to date under 381.986, how many of the total would have come through under subsection four? At least half? There's 22, well, there's two, 22 licenses that have been issued. And the, the important point in understanding the, the open class is that this is one bucket. Licenses come out of subsection one. There were seven that came out of, I should say, subparagraph one. There are additional licenses that came out of subparagraph 2A. That's an, an, um, another 10. Then there are licenses that, that continue to come out under subparagraph four, but they all become available. They all go into the same bucket. Right. So, but are you telling me that there have there's 22 total out of all the different ways they can get there, and 16 of them have come through subsection four? That's right. There's a third textual reason why these four subparagraphs are tied together. And when you look at subparagraph four, as you mentioned, Justice Polson, you see that it uses the words additional licenses. Subparagraph four is looking back at one, two, and three and adding the same type of license to the bucket. This is an expanding bucket of licenses. This is clearly an open class. And furthermore, if we look at the subparagraphs in isolation, so for instance, 2C, we see that there are potential license slots that become available based on the timing of 1 and 2A. So even prior to reaching subparagraph 4, there is an availability of licenses. There's an open class that occurs under 2. Those, that open class is available to anyone who can meet the requirements of the statute. And this is true even of subparagraph three with the citrus preference. Those citrus preferences have not been allocated. Those licenses, the preferences towards those licenses remain available. Also, on, on, the, on the 16 that were issued in subsection four, are any of those, uh, were those issued to entities or persons who already held licenses? Or are they different entities? So the, there were, in subparagraph one, the seven dispensing organizations that came out of the previous medical cannabis statute. Those seven have been allocated licenses. Then under subparagraph 2A, you've got a number of entities that have been previously reviewed by the department, They've been evaluated by the department, they've been scored by the department. Obviously the department has some history with them and there have been licenses that have been allocated to that group, approximately seven. Then as subsection four began to bring on new licenses, there is a group of eight that were in litigation with the department that were settled. All of those were entities the department had some experience with. And now there are 11 licenses that remain available. That have not been issued yet. That's right. That's right. And if floor grown met the statutory requirements, including vertical integration, it certainly could apply for one of those remaining 11 licenses. This is an open class. Let me address a second reason why this is an open class in addition to the fact that new licenses are coming on board. And that's because the statute serves a state interest and it does so in a uniform and rational way. The state's purpose is to implement the constitution's commands for availability and safe use of medical marijuana and by a date certain. Implementing amendment two is clearly an issue of statewide importance. The MHG statute establishes this entire regulatory scheme for a product that's been deemed necessary for Florida patients, but is illegal under federal law and certainly illegal for recreational use under state law. 
The statute balances these interests that we see in the Constitution in two ways. One, the timed entry of MMTCs and according to their readiness. Let me give you two textual examples of that. If you look at Section 8's subparagraphs, they list specific implementation dates. So subparagraph 1 provides licenses by July 3rd, 2017. Just two months later, subparagraph 2A says licenses by August 1st, 2017. Counsel, I'm, just, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can I ask you a question, though? Because sure. I think you've got a really strong argument on this issue about look, viewing it all as one bucket and not slicing it up into the different things for purposes of class. But I, I'm, I've had a hard time understanding from our case law how the, the when we've talked about classifications on the one hand, and then you know things that pursue a kind of overarching state interest not being special laws on the other. If this had been a situation where the need for the state, you know, the availability and safety that's referenced in the, in the new constitutional provision, if that could have been satisfied just by expanding the licenses of the existing DOs at the time that the amendment you know, became part of the constitution, would it have not been a special law if the legislature had said, okay, the people put this into our constitution, we need a safe and readily available supply. And so we're going to expand the authority under the licenses that have already been granted. And they had just left it at that. Obviously then that could raise questions as to whether that complied with the, you know, the, the new amendment in terms of whether that was, you know, would it allow for sufficient, you know, uh, you know, product and everything. But in terms of a special or general law analysis, would, would you be able to point to the larger kind of public interest as a way of saying that's not a special law, even though it's identifying, you know, seven known private entities and giving them this expanded authority? Sure. And if I understand your question correctly, Justice Denise, you're saying if the statute only had a subparagraph one. Right. Which it seems like your, your argument about the public interest in the larger sort of scheme, it seems like if that's kind of an independent way to deal with the general law problem, then it almost doesn't really matter what the classification is. You know what I'm saying? Sure. But I don't know if that's the right way to look at the law, and I'm just curious what your view on that is. Yeah, I have two answers to that. First, uh, quick answer in terms of looking at subparagraph one and whether it's an open class. I, I think that it, it can be argued to be an open class because those licenses don't have to reside with the same MMTC that gets it initially. Those licenses can be sold, they can be transferred, that's done with Department of Health approval. So unlike some of the case law that's found a special law that benefits one city or one track, here you have licenses that can migrate to different MMTCs. I mean, even but, but in, in terms of the in, in terms of the, the privilege granted to a private corporation, the corporation that initially held that license would transfer it for a, a large sum of money. So they would get a, a privilege under the statute, um, irrespective of whether it could be transferred, correct? We don't know that, Justice Lawson. One, this is, this is a free market operation, and it's one that's done under the regulatory structure of the Department of Health. So the Department of Health has to be involved every time when those licenses are sold, as well as revoking those licenses having this license surrendered. So they, those licenses- the record, the record does reflect that they are sold, correct? Absolutely, they're sold, yeah. which, is, which I think proves the point that, the, that this isn't a closed class, even if you look at subparagraph one, those licenses migrate to other entities the, and Florida the, in itself can pursue one. The privilege issue is irrelevant in, until you have established that it's a special law to begin with. And so That's right. it seems like the question with this public interest thing, what I'm wondering is, does that, is that an over, is that essentially kind of a, a separate way of looking at it where, you know, the if the classification is made in the interest of certain, you know, in this case, you've got this brand new constitutional amendment, the people have prioritized this, you know, they've given the department the criteria and whatever, and if the, and if the legislature and the department make the judgment that the best way of satisfying this public need is by essentially just expanding the authority of the six or seven you know, DOs that they inherited. Is that essentially a general law, even if it only applied to that, to that finite group of entities? 
The answer is yes. And, and we've seen that in this course's court's case law, for instance, the Schrader case dealing with the keys, where you've got uh, something of such a significant state interest that providing something to just Monroe County um, is not a special law, as long as it's done in a way that's uniform and rational and that you know, all min municipalities in that case can participate. Here, you've got the same type of thing. You've got a category of DOs. They're all proven to the Department of Health. They're all ready to operate. We know this based on their pre-existing readiness. And for the legislature to meet the Constitution's commands to get these companies up and running fast and safely, to treat them equally among themselves, um, is not a special law. There's classifications that happen all the time in legislation, regulation to meet the state's interests. The test, and we've seen this in the court's cases where it's found a special law, is always because something arbitrary is going on. I mean, you've got either a lack of rational basis, you've got an equal protection problem, you've got an arbitrary classification. None of let, that. Let me ask you, let me ask you uh, uh, why it's not arbitrary to have a provision that that provides that someone's eligible for a, a license because they brought a lawsuit <laughs> we, and they have a lawsuit pending. Sure, uh, Chief Justice, those entities um, were all ones that had already been evaluated and scored by the department and deemed at least close to receiving a license. So they were ones that the department, the legislature knew the department was comfortable with, that the department um, believed would be up and running quickly and safely. And to be honest, even among those in, in 2A, there are questions of how many of those were available. I mean, there's been arguments in litigation that there were six, some say seven, some say 10. So there's not necessarily a known amount of those. It depended on the readiness of those entities that then filed the litigation. That's the basis of it. Not just the fact that they have a lawsuit, but the fact that they have a lawsuit based on the fact that they've already been scored, they've already been ranked, the department already has a comfort level and experience with them. Well, no, I, I think, I don't know how you say they've got a comfort level because they were, they were scored and ranked and found lacking. That, that may be true for the first tranche, but as the bucket grows, as more licenses come on board, the department can work with entities, can expand the regulatory scheme. It's starting with those that it has confidence with, has trust in, that have been, been doing this for several years, and then it expands that scope to newcomers, right? But how would that... But I'm, how I'm, would they? Counsel, I'm, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. You say how? How would that apply to the second subsection? Because you're saying I understand how it might apply to the first subsection of approved, but how does that apply to the people that didn't meet the department standard? Why do they get a priority over those newcomers? And how would that not be a closed or a preferential class when they clearly couldn't meet the standards of the department before, and yet we're giving the legislature is giving them an advantage over someone that's new to the industry. Justice Grossian, uh, two answers to that. One, um, if there's any claimed advantage that Florida makes here, it's purely competition. It's that someone got a head start ahead of them, which has not been deemed to be a basis of a special law. The reason why the statute allocates in those subparagraphs is because we obviously know the DOs are ready to go. I don't think anyone can, can contest that. If we look at subparagraph two, the statute says, these are entities that have been reviewed, evaluated, scored, ranked. They've gone through a Department of Health process. The Department of Health has reviewed them. Now, they may say they're second tier compared to those that were in subparagraph one, but they still have been scored and ranked, right? They still have met some criteria to become an MMTC. Those guys are more ready and not only ready, but safe to enter this market than newcomers, than those the department has no idea, including those that won't even agree to a vertical integration model, which is 
the case with Florida. Okay, Council, you have uh, uh, consumed, with our help, a great deal of help from us, all of your uh, rebuttal time. I will nonetheless afford you three minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Giddings. Yes, Your Honor. Um, as you note by the clock, I'm taking 15 minutes and I'm ceding five minutes of my time to Mr. Kotkamp uh, as an amicus who represents Triangle Capital. Your Honor, um, uh, first I would like to address what Judge Polston mentioned. I'm not sure where opposing counsel is getting 16 licenses separate from the categories. The record shows that there were 22 entities that pre-applied for the dispensing organization uh, program, which is entirely different, different type of mar medical marijuana, and that 22 of those entities have received a license. No one else has received a license. They say there are 11 licenses available. They've said there's seven licenses available. The department has never accepted an application from anyone but these 22 entities. And what they've done is they've given them under one, they've given them under two, and then they've gone back down. And as licenses have become available, the department's position is that they have to meet the categories of one and two, and those have to be exhausted first to the exclusion of all others. So this is a definitely a closed class because no one can ever receive the same privileges that these have had. And, you know, they might have an argument as to one that they could be, quote, grandfathered in if they had actually been up and operating. But you've got, of these 22, you, he says that they're ready. The record shows that they're not, go to the department's website, they're not ready. They're not, dis, many of them are not dispensing. What kind of privileges are they getting that a normal applicant would, would not have? Well, they were just entitled to these licenses that were reserved for them. Um, they don't have to go through a separate application process for this new type of program. They're not separate. They do. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I mean, it does, as your uh, counsel on the other side pointed out, I mean, every single one of these buckets has the qualifier that they have to meet the requirements of this section. So your it's, Honor, not, so it's, you know, it's all of the new requirements that obviously this gives them a priority in line but it's not like they're exempted from the requirements that the legislature has decided that these entities, once everybody's up and running, has to be able to do. No, Your Honor, they um, received a special privilege because they were all given a license. And of the seven, of the seven and number one, almost every one of them have turned around and sold those licenses. So they got these licenses, there were a limited number of licenses, and they sold them. I find it interesting that um, opposing counsel started out his um, argument stating I, that it was a regulatory function because- Justice, Cor Justice Coriel has a question for us. Oh, you. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's, uh, it's the way this works. Um, <laughs> um, what of the point though, that because there is a, li a liquidity to these things, the fact that they're transferable, um, doesn't that speak quite directly to the openness or closeness of, of the class? I mean, if, if it can be resold, aren't we to understand then that basically anybody can come to acquire it? Doesn't that initiate the argument that the, that, that original group is somehow privileged if indeed it doesn't even contain the same you know, set of players that it used to because, because of the liquidity of, of the license? Your Honors, that goes to show just how arbitrary the whole scheme is, because they state that this, these 22 can get their licenses uh, because they're more ready, but then they're going out and selling them. So that eviscerates their argument that this is somehow some type of permissible regulatory scheme. And remember that if you look at the definition of a special law and a general law, even if you were to find that it wasn't a closed class for these in entities that were entitled to their license, you have to have a general law operates uniformly um, within permissible classifications. And I would suggest to you that stating that the department was more familiar with their requirements is an after the fact justification. At the evidentiary hearing, the department testified 
that the only reason for giving the licenses to these entities was because the legislature told them it had to do so. There was no, we're more familiar with them. And so it, whether it's a special law or a general law, these classifications are arbitrary. They're, they were disqualified. They were just Don't suing, we, the, counsel, suing counsel, the legislature. Counsel, when we're looking at laws though, and we're trying to decide whether they're you know, rational or not rational, don't we look at don't we look at it from the legislature's perspective and th ask whether the categories in the abstract are rational categories or not, as opposed to whether you know it, it, if I'm the legislature, it, it doesn't. It seems like it'd be a stretch to say that it's irrational to say that I'm going to prioritize people who've already met my license or licensure requirements for a very you know similar product, and then I'm going to go down the list, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, then once you get to the level of actually licensing the entities, you may say that there be there might be some reason why it would be irrational to give a particular entity the license once you actually dig in and look at it. But if we're looking at it at the level of what's on the what's in the text of the law, it seems like it's a, it would be a stretch to say that this that this scheme that the legislature set up is irrational on its face. Your Honor, I would propose to you that this scheme is irrational under any standard. Both um, the, uh, the, the statute does not regulate how much any of these entities have to produce. They can produce one plant, they can produce a million plants. So the, the whole cap and the whole system of doling out these licenses has no rational relationship to the regulatory scheme of making marijuana both safe and available. In fact, it's keeping it from being available. Um, uh, and these entities were previously deemed to be unqualified. So how can you say that this is a rational classification um, well, they're unqualified privileges. when they're unqualified if you're if you only want 10, but if the if the voters arbitrarily tell you that you've got to have X amount of supply within six months, then why is it irrational to say I'm going to start with the people who are close to having met my other, if I, you know, if I only want two suppliers, then my, my criteria are going to be different than if I need 20. So that's, well, that's not honors, irrational. If, if, if you if, if, well, if you're going to go back to the amendment, um, look at the amendment. It actually puts a cap on caregivers. It allows the department to cap caregivers. It does not allow, it does not say anything else about having caps. What it says is that there have to be regulations to make it safe and available, and that the department is to begin registering um, MMTCs. And then after they register, it evaluates their qualifications. There were a number of MMTCs ready to go. And um, uh, I, I know at one of the prior arguments, one of the justices made a comment that they see a lot of these MMTCs on the streets on their way into work. Well, Your Honor, those MMTCs don't assume that they have product. The record shows that they um, uh, frequently are out of the product that patients need, and then they're charging these exorbitant prices. And why are they doing that? Opposing counsel mentioned uh, a free market. Well, this is everything but a free market. It has created a monopoly of a few uh, entities. And that is why when the licensing scheme is inappropriate and arbitrary, that likewise, this caps that they put on there has to fall as well. Because- On, on, on that point, in subsection four, has there been a license issued to anyone under subsection four that was not entitled to receive under subsections one or two? No, sir. All 22 of all, the only two, 22 licenses that they have been given out all 22 were the 22. There were, it's my understanding that there were 24 entities that originally applied for the prior DO organizations and two of them, their applications were rejected for some reason. So okay. every single applicant that applied got to be first in line and got to have all of these privileges where remember what, what the statute says is that they can, the department can waive the statutory requirements for them they can contract with someone else to do this. So they don't, they're not subject to the cap. They didn't have to do a separate application process. Or, so of, they, the, of the 11, or do you take issue with uh, opposing counsel's statement that there are 11 licenses available to be issued? 
Your Honor, the department has taken numerous different positions on that over time. Whether there's four, seven, or 11, the fact is they've never given out any licenses to anybody but the classes in one and two because the department takes the position that as those licenses under four become available, they have to go back up to exhaust one and two before they can give them to anyone else. If there are 11 open ones, have the ones under one and two now been exhausted so that they're open to give to other people? Well, Your Honor, there is no application process. The department won't accept applications. They have never developed a process, and so there's not even a process in place, and the department was supposed to have developed a registration process within nine months. Ms. Gideon, wasn't that because of the lawsuit, because they were enjoined from going forward with the regulations? No, Your Honor. We brought this lawsuit to keep them from giving out the licenses to the 22, especially the ones in class two, and to start registering MMTCs as they were supposed to do under the amendment, and this lawsuit was stayed, and during the course of the lawsuit... I appreciate that. Let me get back to Article 3, Section 11, A12, and ask this very basic question. Can something be both a special law and a general law? Your Honor... One or the other. I think that they are one or the other. However, the way that... You have not challenged this as an invalid general law based on improper classifications. The issue before us is whether or not this is a special law. Is it special or general, right? Your Honor, we made two arguments below. We said that it was a special law, but we also said it was an arbitrary and not rationally related even under a general law. But remember that the way you determine the classifications under a general law is to whether that particular class is open. And here, you have a set... I take issue with the fact that they say there's one bucket. There's not. There's three buckets. There's those that had DO licenses. There's those that were in litigation with the department. And there's those that everybody else. And only the everybody else are subject to these caps and all of these limitations. And what has happened is that is why, because the department... I guess when we were analyzing Article 3, Section 11A, wouldn't it be a red herring to talk about whether one classification was closed or not? Because if it's a general law, then I mean, that's the inquiry. So you don't determine that it's a general law by determining whether a classification is closed, I don't think. You would look at the law. I mean, this is a law of statewide application, broad application that applies to implement a constitutional amendment. It looks like a general law. It seems like a... So... There are two answers to that, Your Honors. First of all, I believe it is a special law. The fact that you've got numerous cases that we've cited where there has been a statewide law, but when a particular class within that law benefits to the exclusion of everybody else and gets special privileges, then it's an unconstitutional special law. But we also argued that even if you were to find it's not a special law, it still cannot be arbitrary. And I would suggest to you, and we've made these arguments and the trial judge found that these requirements were not rationally related to anything. The department testified below that it would take almost 2,000 medical marijuana treatment facilities to service Florida's patients. And the legislature came in and said, we're going to limit that. We're not going to... And the department was already ready to start issuing those, to begin that registration process. And the legislature stopped them. So I would say... But I go back and I say, this is a set... This is a class, and it's a closed class because only these entities receive these reserved licenses. The legislature might as well just have named them in the statute. And that's what it did by describing who can get the licenses. But I think my point is, can't a general law have a closed class, but not violate Article 3, Section 11A12? Well, I believe that... It's not a special law. Article... That provision applies to special laws. Your Honor, the way you determine whether something is... All of these laws that you've looked at were passed as general laws. 
And if the way you determine whether it's a special law is if the classification is closed. No, so but none of, the, cannot, none, of the, none of the cases that, that people are citing to have any, bear, no resemblance to a situation like this where you have uh, the need for a statewide program on a timetable that's set by the voters in a uh, constitutional amendment where you've got a bunch of you know existing closely related entities that are providing a service and the legislature sets up a comprehensive open scheme that phases in the licenses and that's obviously meant to endure prospectively indefinitely. I mean, this is nothing like the cases where there's one, a, a discrete law that applies to one entity and you're asking whether that's a special or a general law. I mean, there's nothing that I've seen that's even comparable to this. Well, Your Honor, the R.J. Reynolds, I, I, I'm, I'm see, I'm into the my- R.J. Reynolds uh, case had, had a, the signatories to the settlement agreement are, are a closed class. They, they, they had to throw away comment about the plaintiffs maybe being an open class, but the people that were gonna be doing the bond, the, the five or seven companies or however it was, that's exactly like the, the licensees in category one here. No, no, your honors. Um, if you look at all of your cases, there are a number of them that deal with more than one entity. Um, uh, the Hall case dealt with five. You have a number that dealt with three. You just can't carve out these special classes. But I don't want to cut into the time I uh, uh, of Mr. Kotkamp. I would just say, please, your honors, um, uh, all of um, 8A is unconstitutional whether you look at it as a general law or a special law, because it is arbitrary, you have these caps that aren't related to anything. And the whole thing smells bad. It's the right thing to do to make the department do what the constitution requires, which was to begin uh, registering Council, in MTCs. Um, Go ahead. We're gonna let Mr. Kotkamp have time. Yes. We need to Thank do you, so Your now. Thank Mr. You, Kotkamp, you, you, you'll have five minutes. So. May it please the court. My name is Jeff Cott. On behalf of one of the interveners in this case, uh, Triangle Capital Incorporated, uh, I'd like to welcome Justice Curiel and Justice Grosshands to this very unique appeal. Um, most of us are familiar with the line from Shakespeare's Hamlet, something's rotten in Denmark. And when it comes to the regulation of medical marijuana in our state, it's easy to conclude that something is rotten in Florida. Uh, the courts ask a really important question. Is the statute regulating uh, medical marijuana unconstitutional as a special law? We believe the short answer is yes. You know, the Constitution is an expression of the fundamental values of the people. And the Florida uh, citizens have said it's a funda fundamental right. There'll be no special laws, no, no crony capitalism. We're not allowed to use the statutes to hand out special favors to private corporations, which is exactly what has happened in the medical marijuana arena. I think it's really important because the current version of 381-986 refers back to the original version. You really have to look to the legislative history of how we got here in the first place, going back to the session in 2014, when we saw a uh, the night before session ended, a 15-page strike-all amendment comes up on the floor of the House. And that's the first time this idea, this special privilege, this special law came about. This idea that we're going to limit the people that could participate in this new multi-billion dollar market to nurseries that had operated in Florida for 30 or more continuous years with 400,000 or more plants. Uh, I don't know, there was obviously no public testimony, no evidence, no nexus whatsoever between the idea that if you've grown shrubs and flowers for 30 years, or that you have 400,000 of them, that somehow uh, you're uniquely qualified to successfully grow and sell uh, medical marijuana. Uh, as has been brought up, uh, there were 24 uh, applicants for the low THC medical marijuana license. Two were disqualified, leaving 22. It's worth noting, by the way, that a number of those applicants came right at that 400,000 plant mark. So it's fairly obvious that the criteria for the license targeted specific companies. Now, uh, as was mentioned, now we're sitting here with 22 licenses, the exact number of qualified applicants for low THC licenses in 2015. But 
not anyone outside that special class has ever had an application accepted by the Department of Health. No one else has ever had an application assessed. And obviously no one's uh, outside of that special select class created all the way back in 2014 has ever been issued a license. And I know Mr. Jaco mentioned uh, a couple of the license issued recently, and I'm really not even clear where the authority comes to settle some of these lawsuits and just give away licenses, but at least one of the licenses was given away to a company that wasn't even in operation anymore. And that's just like getting, giving them a lottery ticket. Uh, but the fact is, this whole market has been closed to anyone outside that special class created in 2014, and it's been carried forward in the new version of the statute. I want to just mention briefly this issue of, of remedy. Uh, it was raised below, and I think the trial court, uh, he did his best to try and, and fashion a remedy. I think all of us share the view that courts shouldn't legislate from the bench. But what do you do when you're in the position of Judge Dotson, where the executive and legislative branches appear to want to uh, ignore the Constitution? And I think he did a very good job of saying, let's not create complete chaos in this market, but we've got to open this up and start accepting applications and, and accepting them. We're not saying today that the state should give floor grown or the interveners a license. What we are saying is they needed the opportunity to have an application accepted and assessed, not scored against each other, but if they meet the criteria established by the state, they should be able to get uh, into this market. Ultimately, our goal is to provide affordable, safe medical marijuana to patients. If we let the free market handle this, we'll achieve that goal. And if there's no questions, thank you for your time. Thank you, counsel. We now turn to rebuttal. Mr. Jaco. Mr. Chief Justice, I'm gonna spend the entire time of my rebuttal responding to questions from the justices, if I may. Uh, I'd first like to start with a question that was posed by Justice Polston, uh, trying to understand kind of the counting of these licenses. So you clearly have seven licenses that come out of subparagraph one. You then have 10 licenses that are available in subparagraph two. Then you in four, you now have 16 licenses that have come online, total of 33. So Absolutely, the math shows that of the 22 licenses that are currently online, some of those have come from subsection four. Justice Lawson, you asked questions related to um, you know, this being a general law. And clearly it is because it implements the constitutional commands. But even if we look at it from an analysis of a special law, it still meets um, the general law criteria. One of the things that, and, and, and particularly because 11 licenses are now available, it's an open class. One of the things that Floor Grown mentions is that there aren't any current applications. Well, the reason why is because the department's been in litigation this whole time, including the injunction that we've been facing from this litigation. As soon as this court is able to rule, uh, hopefully on the merits, um, hopefully we can get some clarity and reopen that application process. Justice Coriel, you had asked a question about the liquidity uh, involved in those uh, licenses that come out of subparagraph one. And yeah, it's absolutely there. We've seen it. Um, but I just want to be clear that when those licenses are sold, they have to be done with the department's approval and they have to meet the same statutory requirements. That includes vertical integration. So any entity that's vertically integrated approved by the department, meeting the statutory requirements, could certainly purchase any of those, let's say, subparagraph one licenses. And Justice Meese, I'd like to in particular just mention uh, one example, that's an enforcement example that I really think shows why the statute meets the constitutional interest. There was recently a case where mold contamination was found in medical marijuana. It was unable to determine exactly where in the process did it happen at cultivation, did it happen in processing and distribution. But the fact that the department can enforce against one entity 
that control the entire pipeline and should be accountable and responsible for that pipeline ensured they addressed the problem. They had a $64,000 fine and that company got its practices cleaned up so that patients could have safe medical marijuana. That's exactly why the vertical integration is necessary um, to have this kind of safe and available regulatory scheme. I thank the court for entertaining our arguments today. All right, well, we thank uh, uh, all of you for your arguments uh, today. Before the uh, uh, session of court concludes, I want to belatedly welcome Justice Grosshands to the bench. I forgot to do that at the outset because we've been appearing uh, together uh, on Zoom, and uh, but we're delighted that Justice Gro Grosshands has joined us. Uh, we're delighted that she's uh, uh, here to participate in this uh, oral argument and, and all the uh, proceedings to come. Uh, so welcome. Justice Gross, Gross Pence, uh, we uh, are looking forward to uh, working with you for, for many years, and uh, we appreciate your contribution um, in the past uh, to the work of our judicial system and the contribution I know you will make uh, going forward. Thank you. I appreciate that, Chief Justice. All right. Well, um, that concludes uh, today's session of court. So we are now adjourned.